I want to talk about uh, the same project, Global Conscious Project, I've uh, talked about before here a number of times, but very quickly go through the beginnings of uh, and the description of the project and then work toward um, something like modeling and theory. Even though I'm not a theorist, um, I do think about those things quite a bit. This is a picture of the gathering in New York. I think there were about half a million people last September on Earth Day uh, with a focus on uh, the climate changes and so forth. And um, I thought this is a kind of event that we call a global event. Could we possibly capture a picture somehow of this, uh, the intense emotion and interest and shared ideas of this uh, gathering in New York. That's a, a picture of data which ought to run on a kind of level, whoops, <laughs> I have fat fingers like everybody else. Anyway, the data should run level, but they actually uh, are way out of line, so to speak. So I'm thinking, um, to what we're trying to do is build a science that can actually allow us to capture some aspect of human consciousness in uh, a way that we might even call quantitative. Uh, we began thinking about these things, or at least I did, in the pair lab with um, an experiment where people tried to change the behavior of a machine um, with intention, no wires, no buttons. We found a significant effect when we asked people to get high uh, numbers versus low numbers. So they produced something that would uh, wind up being rather far in the high direction uh, relative to what was expected. Similarly for the low numbers. Uh, pretty successful, highly significant uh, differences. The next step in um, the progression towards something like gathering information about global consciousness was to go outside the lab um, and to do what we called field reg or field REG experiments. We, by this time, benefited from the miniaturization of electronics to the point where you could uh, put a, a random number generator on a palm top computer or laptop and easily carry it wherever you wanted to go. Uh, the software would record the data continuously, and then you could press a button to mark the beginning and the end of an interesting period of time. And here are a couple of examples. In the, on the left, we have um, a visit with a small group um, to Devil's Tower, accompanied by um, a Native American shaman, the Shoshone, whose personal mission was to heal these sacred sites that had been kind of desecrated in some sense by careless, uh, thoughtless people. He didn't understand what we were doing, but when I showed him that graph, he said, I think I get the idea, because he could see that uh, data line wasn't going down the middle. It was off the scale. And I uh, went to Egypt with a group of 19 uh, people who were pretty, very much interested in the ancient religion and uh, spiritual tr tradition and so forth. And, we went to all of the temples we could, the ruins, and we also went into the Great Pyramid. And this uh, figure shows in the first segment uh, our group entering the pyramid. And if you uh, look at the trend there, there isn't a trend, that's just level. Uh, not interesting yet. But the next segment has us in the Queen's Chamber doing meditations and um, chanting. And following that, uh, the Grand Gallery, which is a fantastic place if you have a chance to be in Egypt and visit the interior of the Great Pyramid, I'd say check out that out. It's my favorite place. That led to the King's Chamber where we did a couple of long meditations in these two segments here. And then this last part is everybody splitting up, no longer a group, no longer working together. In any case, uh, we think that um, the field REG protocol showed us lots of evidence that group consciousness is a kind of natural thing. Normally we don't really notice it because when you're in it, you can't really be observing it very well. Some examples, we think about group resonance afterwards. 
and uh, we call a great um, meeting or an engaging talk uh, that, but only afterwards. During the event, we're engaged. So those are a variety of experiment experiences that we could think of as group consciousness. The next step toward uh, the Global Consciousness Project is to um, consider the, what we had learned from 12 years of, of um, intention experiments and another several years of field experiments, um, leading to lots of other kinds of questions. What if you have two or more uh, random number generators? What if they're further away? What if they're remotely located? So we built a, um, a network to answer a question like this. Could we possibly capture something uh, that you could think of as global consciousness using the same technology? That's what we tried to do first with some prototypes. This is the data from uh, Princess Diana's funeral, the red line. This is a cloud of, uh, of uh, pseudo-random traces. It's not um, off the scale hugely, but it's very, it was very um, encouraging. So we proceeded to build a network uh, that was intended to take data um, every second, every day, over years. And in fact, we've now been running this network, which is a kind of instrument for looking at global consciousness for 15, 17 years. If you want to get more detail, by the way, the, uh, the uh, best and uh, fastest address is global-mind.org. This, um, our uh, basic hypothesis of, is a overarching hypothesis is a kind of operational definition of what we're talking about when we say global consciousness. Who knows if there really is such a thing, but uh, what we are trying to do is repeatedly um, ask a question that will allow us ultimately to say yay or nay about an idea like this, events which focus attention and emotion shared by people all around the world will correlate with changes in our data uh, from this network of random number generators. And what we do um, to test this is individual experiments that are each very specific. Their beginning is uh, identified, the end is identified of a period of time during which we're going to test the data. And um, what, what we know from the statistics is that this, the result should be, if we picture it, a random walk but it very often is not a random walk. The random walk would have a horizontal trend. This is a good example. I'll show you some bad examples too, where we don't, we don't always win. Um, about 70% of the time, however, we win in the sense that the uh, data go in the direction we predict, which is upward in this kind of graph. And uh, about 20% of the time, or a little bit less than that, it may be statistically significant by the normal 5% criteria. So we've now collected um, nearly 500 e events and looking at disasters of various kinds, natural and human caused, um, acts of war, and, but also celebrations, pleasant kinds of events. Um, here's an example of the, that everybody has probably seen if you've seen any of my talk. Uh, but it was definitely an example of the um, world gathering around an event and feeling deep, strong, shared emotion. Um, again, by now, um, we know the data should be running level, but for about two days, the data were definitely not running the way random data should. We looked at this in a variety of different ways. Here's a different uh, kind of analysis that looked instead of at what you might think of as a mean shift, this is a variance change, and it also spikes hugely around on that day. Unfortunately, there are lots and lots of examples of um, terrorist um, or uh, human-caused disasters. I'll just run through a bunch of them. There are some that go completely in the opposite direction of what we expect. That counts against our bottom line but um, it is a formal event, so it is part of the database. Um, and in the long run, it turns out that we have uh, far more of the kind that 
that match our prediction than otherwise. Fortunately, there are uh, some other kinds of uh, things that we uh, can, can look at in the world, positive events. This one is a, a really, uh, to my mind, very interesting one. This is the Kumbh Mela, which happens in India. Um, there's a, a, two versions of it. Uh, the really large scale one is every 12 years or something like that. But there's one every, there, there are some in between. And we've looked at this now uh, three times. And if you, if this transparency kind of you know, works, you can see that there's so much similarity from one to another that we could say maybe that is the result of 20 million people coming together to do something they really feel is important. We also look at New Year's every year. And we look at it a couple of different ways. One of them is by uh, looking at the variance of all, all of our data uh, which we predict will drop down while people are beginning to focus on midnight. And um, that we use a signal averaging to look at all the time zones and so forth. And this is a selected example that is like a kind of perfect demonstration of how the data should look when it confirms our hypothesis. There are some years where it doesn't do that, but overall, this analysis shows a significant um, deviation one year after another. We also have lots of organized things in the world. Most of you uh, either uh, have attended or at least know about some kind of event you could go to, like that peace uh, a climate change gathering in New York that I showed as the first slide. We do this um, every year in September, September 21st. This is an, a good example of of data that don't confirm the hypothesis, but mo most of the examples do confirm the hypothesis. This is year after year of the International Day of Peace. One of um, uh, my colleagues um, decided to put together a compilation of all the events that have people either meditating or praying or marching for something like a brighter future. And he called it a global harmony. And this is a picture of uh, something like 100 uh, events selected from the database, uh, all of which sort of match this idea that we should, and a lot of people do, work toward uh, global harmony. His name is Brian Williams. He, I think he's a member of SSE and hoped he might be here this time. So the bottom line of the data from this experiment is, can be shown in a scatter plot. Um, this might not look very impressive, but there is a small difference between the expected dotted dark line, black line, and this blue line, which is the um, average of all of the events that we've looked at so far. It's only one third of a standard deviation away from the uh, predicted or expected value for random data, but because there are 491 events, the, the uh, composite across all of those, uh, those uh, individual samples has a z-score of seven. That's a seven sigma effect. So it's non-trivial. This is exactly the same data presented in the format I've used for the uh, individual events. Here you can see there are z z um, up zags, zigs and zags, but uh, the trend, because of the preponderance of data that go in the direction we're uh, expecting or predicting it will, um, produces a line that just goes further and further away uh, from what's expected, the horizontal um, trend. And this is a way of showing how we do controls. Um, you can sample all of the data which are not in the events, that's about 98% of the data, or you can do something like uh, just a computer simulation of what, what we can think of as a, a pseudo series. And that produces a cloud of data like the, in this gray, these gray lines. And again, you can see, easily see that the real data are very different from, uh, from what's in that uh, picture. So what kinds of things are important? I'll talk a little bit about that and then move on to how it might work. Mass consciousness, 
seems to be a part of the picture. Um, we need to, we're looking for powerful emotions, but shared. And I think it's important, and, and this will become obvious um, later and when we're talking about how it might be uh, working, uh, the experimenter has to be willing to accept uh, the data as they come. And we know from analysis that uh, events that have really large numbers of people um, engaged produce bigger effects than small uh, events. Uh, an interesting one that lots of people are interested to check out is the question whether a positive event will have a stronger effect than a negative event. Is um, New Year's better than a uh, terrorist attack? <laughs> the answer is that as best you know, we can do this kind of thing by categorizing, they're pretty much similar. Either one, as long as it gathers us all together, uh, will produce the, about the same kind of effect. It does need to be, generally speaking, something like intense or unique, shocking, surprising, arresting, or deeply moving. So what we're talking about is emotions, but shared emotions. And it turns out, I'll show you a picture of this. Um, being awake and aware allows us to contribute to what we're thinking of as a kind of global consciousness but, uh, more than when we're asleep. This is, uh, uh, that, uh, I'll, I'll show you a picture in a moment, an analysis by Peter Bansell, who I think has talked about and definitely has published an article or two in JSE. Categorizing the many events that we have, we can ask things like um, uh, this question about the numbers of people involved. If we do just uh, large and small, the difference is actually significant. But there is a tendency for larger events to be uh, better. We can categorize events by almost any standard. One that I uh, have done is, set, is emotions like fear, love, compassion, and so forth. How much does the event show or embody compassion? Turns out that it, the events that do that uh, produce the largest effects that we see just about. Here's the figure I've been advertising. The blue line that we waves up and down is data from the events, data collected during the events, um, over, and there's two cycles of uh, 24 hours. So over here, we're, um, the, where the effect size is smallest is in the middle of the night, about three in the morning. This is uh, 6 p.m. I guess everybody is like getting ready to eat or something. Okay. And uh, down below is a kind of what you might think of as the, uh, the rest of the picture. That's uh, when we are, there are none, no events, it's just uh, what the data look like normally. So we are contributing to whatever's going on in these data when we're awake much more strongly than when we're asleep. Um, a long perspective, if we look at all the data, not just the ones in the events, we have a, um, a, a figure that some, uh, some, uh, somebody contacted me and said, I was looking for something that uh, was familiar, uh, had a familiar form to the graph that you call your um, long-term long um, uh, picture. And he said, the dollar index seems to track that pretty well. So we, uh, uh, I, I did the graphs, and, um, or he did, and uh, it turns out that, I guess I can't see it for some reason on this figure, but it continues uh, up to now. I should note that uh, presidential approval ratings track about the same way. So this is just correlations, not causation. So, a couple of different kinds of models seem to be um, most likely, or at least lots of people propose them. One of them is that this is all an experimenter effect. And um, it's, uh, I try to be agnostic about it, but it seems to me to be very unlikely that I'm responsible for all the big, uh, rather large changes in data in a network that expands or, or covers the whole world. Um, there, some of the arguments are, though, like um, Helmut Schmidt said, um, well, a more familiar uh, idea is uh, 
feedback from the future. Ed May said, my prediction, Roger Nelson's predictions are better than um, uh, the other people who make predictions. And it turns, they are, but it's not a significant difference. Um, Peter Bansell says, there can't be any psi without intention because we have an X or. I don't have time to go into the details, but uh, I think that there's a problem in that kind of reasoning because we, um, there may be something going on that it's not just bits. Uh, moving on to an, the, a, another kind of um, possible source, it, 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 we have evidence that um, there can be something like um, PK happening. And uh, the result is correlation of, between these devices, which are separated by thousands of kilometers. And we have about a dozen different parameters that won't fit um, the, uh, the model of um, the experimenter effect, but will fit into a PK model. I'm sorry, I have run out of time, so I won't be able to uh, talk about this in any kind of detail, but I would, add it. Um, I'm thinking about and more and more deeply convinced that a model based on something uh, like David Bohm's implicate order might make some sense. That what we're really talking about is something like um, um, active information that can be actualized if there's a need for it, and experiments which provide a need for the information that could structure what's happening to, say, a random number generator or, or uh, a system that, re that produces correlation. And um, so it could be that this active information then is actualized because there's a need for it created by an experimenter. So there is an experimenter effect, but I think it's just in doing the experiment. So thank you. In the healing research that I do, I, I've come to the, a reasonably similar conclusion that healing is not something that happens just between two people. It's rather a response to need. Yeah. I said, I think healing is more a response to need. And so I'm, I'm wondering, in the spirit of connections, it could be all over the place. Roger, with regard, I want to ask the question about polarity. You talked about sometimes the curves go up and sometimes the curves go down. And my understanding is that, and, and, and please correct me, but my understanding is that you have a bunch of um, microscopic measurements you're making, and then you do some kind of manipulation on that to try to eliminate um, drift in your instrument and bias and all that kind of stuff. So one way to say that is you're, you're making a measurement of many, many variables, all those bits that are going to get XORed or whatever you talk about. That's a measurement in some high dimensionality space, say it. 56 dimensionality space or 64 dimensionality space or whatever it is and then you're choosing some direction in that 64 dimensional space and you're saying I'm going to call this direction positive and then the other direction is negative or something like that and so I want to ask you know how do you choose that orientation of your um, of your vector in that Hilbert space and uh, does that affect what the positive or negative means in your result? I chose the direction of, for the predictions in a kind of three-dimensional space in which we did these field REG experiments for a long time. What we knew was that we weren't, there wasn't an intention to push the data one direction or the other direction. So what we were asking is, is there an expansion or an increase in the variance? And that I plot as, a, as a, an increasing deviation or um, a trend away from in the positive direction. So I don't know about 54 dimensions. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I uh, was, was hoping to clarify something I didn't quite understand about the, uh, about the way you do local time zones and things like the analysis of bigger effects when people are awake. Um, so 
how, how do you do the uh, uh, time zone analysis with New Year's Eve when you're, you're apparently analyzing something in local time zones, but you've got a network scattered all over the world? Uh, you should talk with Peter Vansell for the details about it, but essentially what it amounts to is looking at the data, um, that, which are correlations between these devices in a time zone while people are awake, and then concatenating the ones, uh, concatenating the corresponding ones in the next time zone when people are awake. Does that answer the question? I think so. <laughs> uh, you can't possibly answer this here, but please put all of your analysis details in on a JSC article sometime soon. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, currently, it sounds like you're looking at world events and then backtracking that to the data to find the, the correlation across these different REGs, right? Is there a way, given your current state with the technology, to regionalize and network the REGs looking for local regional coherence and then have some kind of signaling mechanism to say, hey, there's a lot of coherence within you know, re you know, this particular region and then back that, track that to a, a concurrent event. Hmm. Does that make sense? Well, um, the last, I'm not so sure about the last part, but the first part, yes, it is possible. I'm hoping that um, other people will be interested in in a sense, re replicating, building a better network with now today, this was started so long ago that storing a gigabyte or 10 gigabytes was a lot of <laughs> storage, right? So we need a lot more detailed information to do the kind of thing that you're talking about. There needs to be, I think, a fairly substantial number in each of the regions you might be interested in um, in order to get a, you know, a big sample where you have lots of correlations that uh, might or might not occur. And I think the last thing you said was something like, uh, look for an event and then find, uh, look for a deviation in the data and then look for the event. We can't afford to do that. We don't do that because the world is very complicated. So if you find a spike in the data and start looking around, you'll find dozens That's why I meant regionally coordinating. So looking, if you had some kind of mechanism to sample the different REGs in real time, and then narrow your regional space. So let's say I'm looking at only REGs in Texas, for example, and then looking for a regional event in Texas that you know some have some kind of signaling mechanism to say there's a lot of coherence, you know, in this slice of time. Yeah. Is there a concurrent uh, ongoing event in that region of just these you know three or four REGs, for example? Yeah. Does that make sense? Well, we actually do have a, a very beginning, you know, like a rough kind of approximation to that, if I'm understanding you correctly. Um, I mentioned small events, large events. What the small events really mean is something that's regional, that uh, somebody really wants to find out if this event makes an effect on the global network. Uh, the analysis that we formally do covers the whole network, but when you start looking at the effect of the distance separating these REGs, you find that it matters if the event is a small one. What that suggests is that the effect is local, uh, to some degree. People in the rest of the world don't know about it even. So the people who do know about it in that region um, have some effect on the device. So if you, set, if you now do a correlation with a further separated REG, it will be weaker because there's no person there. Yeah. Thank you, Roger. Yep.